Hi, hi everybody. Uh, you might know me from such events as Ancient City Ruby. <laughs> Has anyone seen this talk before? Yes, okay, let me rephrase. Has anyone seen this talk before and does not want to see it again? Okay, cool. So, Sinatra and six lines. How to do crazy stuff with Ruby. I don't need to share, so better for standing up. Hi, I'm Constantine. And, but we warned, there was a big debate on whether this talk should go first or Paolo Stack should go first because in this talk, you will learn nothing, nothing useful. Absolutely not, and you've, you've been warned. And also, you should prepare for the strangest code slides. In the beginning, Mats gave us Ruby. This is Mats giving us Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> that down there, I was a bit worried for, for a while that that might be something random because I copied that off his Facebook page, but then it was uh, confirmed to me that that actually means, it doesn't say Yukuhiro Matsumoto, it said it says Matsumoto Yukuhiro, something with Japanese names. Um, anyway, if you've not heard about Ruby, there's some really good resources out there. <laughs> Where you can read up on Ruby. <laughs> and this talk is also, besides Ruby, this talk is also about obfuscation and other thing, uh, fun things you can, yeah, you can do with code. And there is a, a quote I really like about obfuscation that's until programmers stop acting like obfuscation is morally hazardous, they're not artists, just kids who don't want their food to touch. But first, to make sure we're all on a similar level knowledge-wise, I'm going to quiz you. And it's really important that you participate. I'm going to show you Ruby code, and you're going to tell me what it evaluates to. The first piece of code is really easy. It's just three characters. Suggestions. If you type this in IRB, what comes out in the end? True. True? False. False. Any it's other suggestions? Exclamation. False. Yes, false. Why is it? Yeah. Why is it false? <coughs> not not exclamation mark. That's correct. Because it's like uh, question mark exclamation mark is since one nine. This is a string. So one nine two zero oh, two one. This is a string. A string exclamation mark. And in one eight and earlier, this is a an integer that corresponds to the character exclamation mark. And then if you neg negate the whole thing, it turns false. You passed that one. The participation was very... <laughs> somehow the participation came mainly from the one guy who's seen my talk before. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. It's still very simple, only two different kinds of characters, but a few more of them. Any suggestions for this actually might be why, why this is... This is valid Ruby. There's no space in there, no nothing. Have you seen any construct with those characters before? Ternary. Yeah, there is a ternary operator here. If I highlight it, it so the ternary operator is expression. This expression is evaluated if the first if the expression is true, and this expression is evaluated if it's false. So this obviously evaluates to colon. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, not bad. You figured everything out, but it was only a few of you, so I'm going to step, take one step back and show you something easier. There's a very common method. Like One of the things you probably had issues with, there were no method calls, right? But there is uh, one, one method that you probably use a lot, or two methods that you probably use a lot because they're super powerful. They're eval and pack. They're, they're, they're the basic repertoire, pack and unpack are um, for dealing with strings and, and arrays. So what does this evaluate to? Cafe. <laughs> it's pretty easy. If you, exp if you expand this, this is a dot, this is one, one six. Um, 
and that there actually is a packed string, so that's actually 2s, so that's dot 2s16, so it's a uh, um, it's kind of evaluating that number in base 16, and that is cafe, <laughs> and it's like, you can see that because C, A, F, E is actually a valid number in base 16. Okay, now we have some, some basic tooling that lets us allow to write Ruby programs. There's, there's one big thing that's still missing when you want to write a Ruby program, besides uh, those methods and mechanisms, that is here docs. Have you heard about here docs? Yeah. It's those multi-line strings, and you can give it a separator that, that you want to. Uh, so very common is to say like um, less less than less than HTML, and then have some HTML, and then say HTML again. And did you know that when you put the separator in in quotation marks, you can actually use any string. That's including spaces. <laughs> So, what do you think happens when I run this program? It's and a string. No, there's actually code in here that's executed. Um, you have to really look closely. You probably can't see it from over there, but there are uh, little four spaces here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let me highlight that. There are four spaces here. <laughs> so when you when you when you run this code, it will say undefined method foo. And this this here docs is super powerful with a basic technique that I like to refer to as distraction. Um, so just structuring your program in a way that suggests a different program flow. For instance, if you look at this, can anyone say? Like, look at this and tell me what will be printed out. I mean, there is not so many options here. Like, will Hello World be printed out? Will OK Let's See be printed out? Will Yippee be printed out? Or how did that happen? Or like all of them or any sub combinations? OK Let's See Yippee. That's what you say, Mr. Meta Programming in Ruby. <laughs> It actually prints, it only prints, how did that happen? Let me restructure that code for you. The code looks like this. It's exactly the same code. So you see, this is actually a block that is passed to between. Between does not take a block, but between also does not complain about a block. <laughs> so this block is never run. So the if clause starts here and then goes down here. And this is actually a one line if. This, so the own if we would be in here only would only be called if one is smaller than three, but we never actually get here. So we could, because we jump right away to this else part. So you can see in this reformatted version. Smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> if you think that's impressive, let me introduce you to the master of bending code, Yusuke Endo. He's Japanese, he has a block that's not well maintained, like probably most of us. And one of his most famous programs is this. I added some highlighting that does not correspond to the language it's written in. Uh, the language, as you can easily see, is Ruby. So all this around here is Ruby code. Now, if you have this program and execute it, it will output something. It will output this program. If you execute that, it will output this program, and so on. So this is very, I mean, I, I would have no idea how to go about this. It's very impressive to me. But there is one basic technique that I want to talk about before I come back to Hisuke Endo, that is flip-flops. Have you ever heard of flip-flops, the flip-flop operator in Ruby? One person who has not seen my talk has heard of it. <laughs> um, so the name does not come from the shoes. The name actually comes from these uh, flip-flops that are basically one-bit memories. Um, so the state of the flip-flop <coughs> does not only depend on the input, but also on its previous state. But in Ruby, flip-flops look like this, dot, dot. So <coughs> this is not a range. This is not a range 
from true to false or something. This all is a flip-flop operator. So any guesses what this program might output if you run it, this piece of code? Numbers 3 to 5, yes. It outputs the numbers 3 to 5 because in the beginning the state of the flip-flop is false. And it starts with 1 and this condition is still false and it goes up till it's 3. So with 3 this condition is now true and that will flip the flip-flop. So the next time the condition is visited, with 4 it's still true, then with 5 it's still true, but back here this then becomes true, true, which makes the flip-flop flip again. So once i is 6, the whole thing is false. So we'll print out 3, 4, 5. There are very, so this just, it's very obvious how this is super useful um, <laughs> in writing. I use it so often. <laughs> but there, there are weird edge cases here, depending on what you want to do. So you mentioned this program. What will that print out? What would you expect? I mean, the, so from, from thinking about this, at one point, this expression will become true, which is when it's 3. Now the, but the expression back here is also true. So the question is, will it double flip? Or will it just flip once? So the interesting part is, is this expression false for 4, or is it not? And it turns out it does that. So this becomes true, turning the whole statement true. And then when, when <coughs> but this flips it back for the next evaluation. So we'll only output three. And I, I see how this can be useful in some cases, but most of the time not really, because then I could just do i equals, equals three and like leave that part out. Um, so there is another version of this operator with three dots. With three dots, it will just remain true because it will, with three dots, it ignores the second statement if the first statement is true. Very useful. Uh, I actually seriously tried to use it in real code recently, but uh, failed. So there was this issue, Ruby issue 5400, <laughs> also known as, can we please remove flip-flops, in which Magnus Holm said, Nobody knows them, nobody uses them, let's just get rid of flip-flops, shall we? Along comes our friend, Yusuke Endo. Hello, I'm one of the few users of flip-flop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't actually know if I have this code. So, and he shows real-world code that he uses. This is his real-world code. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for the flip-flops, they are down here. Okay, let me, let me see if I have this code. Can you all see this? So it's in presentation. So this is what that program do, does. Um, some flickering. I think it's cool if I zoom out. Well, maybe I should not have done that. But it's kind of, you get the idea, it's kind of a fragile <coughs> thing. It's actually very weird. Um, but yes, obviously you need flip flops. <laughs> but then he said, Sorry for off topic. I have no objection to deletion. <laughs> Interestingly, the issue it was still not removed because why would you remove it? There was this big debate. I was working full time on Robinius and I used Robinius before that. And I opened an issue. One of the earliest issues I opened with Robinius back in, I don't know, 2008 or two, yeah, uh, was um, hey, flip, uh, Robinius does not implement flip flops. And Evan Phoenix, the creator of Robinius, said to me, if you can show me real world code using flip flops, I will implement it myself. Up until then, forget about it. So I went out on my quest to search for real world <laughs> flip flop code. 
back in back then, uh, Google's uh, Google Code Search was still a thing, which is actually really amazing because it let you search with regular expressions. So I created all those amazing regular expressions, searching for any possible flip flop variation, and um, I found two types of code using flip flops. One was testing that flip flops work. <laughs> The other was demonstrating how flip-flops work. <laughs> but now, thanks to this issue comment, I finally had real-world code. At the time, I was working full-time on Robinia, so I sat down and implemented it myself. <coughs> this is a commit. It is the most stable feature Robinia has because there has not been a single bug report on this. <laughs> Uh, interesting thing, as an aside, I implemented this fully in Ruby. This is not all the code, but this is the most important code. This is the code generating the bytecode from the flip-flop expression. So Robinius could already parse it because it just uses the C Ruby parser, but it couldn't compile it. So this is the code compiling it to bytecode. Um, yes. Almost Sinatra. Completely different topic. Almost Sinatra had the goal to be a Sinatra implementation in as little code as possible. And it's now, right now, it's just six lines. When I first gave this presentation, it was eight lines. Got pull requests, and now it's only six lines. And obfuscation was never the goal, it was just a byproduct. It just happened. This is the code. I guess you can all read it. Um, if you memoize it, you don't even have to check it out on GitHub. So what works? Configure blocks work, sessions work, helpers work, including incrementing counters, etc. cetera. Um, before blocks work, uh, you can assign instance, like route blocks obviously work. You can assign instance variables, and they can be handed to a template. It supports any template language Sinatra supports. And it supports query parameters, it supports passing in local to templates, um, and as I said, it supports sessions. It supports inline templates. I'm not sure if any of you have done a lot with Sinatra, but you can have the templates in like a views directory, but you can also say enable inline templates, and then we'll parse everything after end, which, with which you can end the Ruby code in a file, and then you can mark uh, templates like this. And so I wrote this over a weekend. I put this out there, and then I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it for more than a year before someone first asked me to talk about this. Um, so I s they asked me to talk about this. In, so I gave a talk in 2011, one in 2012, one in 2013 about this topic, and now again in 2014. But so in 2011, I had this big problem looking at the code that I did not understand it. Luckily, if you Google for it, there are plenty of blog posts. There are actually way more blog posts now. I think there are at least like seven, eight, or nine blog posts out there from some people that try to explain how my code works. <laughs> it was very, very helpful to me. <laughs> yeah. One of the mi main techniques that actually all the, code, uh, all the blog posts explain is what I call simplify and compress. So to run almost Sinatra or Sinatra, there, there are a few things you need to do. You need to load dependencies, and then you need to set up traps. That's for system signals listening, so you can actually kill the server when it's running. So this code would look like that. Require rack, which those are exactly the, the depend these dependencies are also in Sinatra, except for backports. So load rack, load tilt, load backports, and then set a trap on int and set a trap on term, so we can call the application. The problem with this is that's already six lines of code. But so way simpler than writing down the same lines of code is putting them in loops. This is very dry because we only call require once. <laughs> but it's still six lines of code. 
so the, the thing I realized with if you have two such loops is you can, then tur you can turn that into one single loop. Just put everything in one array. <laughs> then you get that, you try to require it, which will fail for int and term. You rescue that and you say trap. And already we're only at three lines of code. Um, there's a lot of, lot of overhead you can remove there. Very clean code, very readable. <laughs> so the thing is that here's this space. This space really annoys me. But we can't remove this space because then it would be L rescue. Or we could put parents around here, but then it wouldn't actually save us anything. But here's a, the amazing trick. If you have two such um, statements that both only work for a subset of the array, you can simply swap them around and try to trap, try to set up a trap. And this will raise an error for rack tilt and backports, but work for int and term. And now the nice thing is, since there's a, a curly bracket here, you don't need a space in between. <laughs> Save this whole character. Another thing that I really encourage you to do is never ever use each. Each is an anti-pattern. Because it's four characters, <laughs> map is only three. <laughs> <laughs> and can, you can remove some more spaces. And the, la the last thing is a cosmetical uh, issue. It will actually not remove any, any uh, characters, but it replaces larger characters with smaller characters. This is with, uh, with percent %w, which is an array of strings. You can actually use anything to terminate um, the, the strings. And so you can actually replace that with a dot, which is a smaller character. And, and it's not really like, it's not really less code, but it looks like it's less code. <laughs> <laughs> And if you look at that, that's actually the first line of all Sinatra. Then the other thing you do is you fake it till you make it. So you, it, all the th things I showed you, they only work for the basic examples. They only work for when you try out if they work. If you would run almost Sinatra on any large Sinatra app, it will fail, I promise you. So things you do, f things I do, for instance, you do have these blocks, get something, post something, uh, delete something, etc. But it doesn't actually matter what you, what you use here. This actually just is a, kind of an alias for calling map in Rec Builder, which is like in the config group. So it actually only looks at the path and does not look at the verb. But um, no one that ever played with it notices that, so not my problem. Uh, the other thing is the block can, also, it can only return a string, and one single string. And the response status code is always 200, and the content type is always sex HTML. And there's also a global lock, because like everything is sent to global objects, and everything is pulled in. Global objects is the best thing if you want to save curve. So one thing I do a lot is I define methods from arrays, from lists of things. And defining methods dynamically works with define method, but say, always saying object.define method, because I obviously define every method on every object, just in case, you never know where they're called. <laughs> so one thing that you want to do is pull that out, that method, just grab it, and pull it out into a constant, just a single letter constant, D for defining methods. And then there's this really nice syntax with uh, parents where you say D dot parents. It's, it's a shorthand for saying call. Um, there's another shorthand for saying call and one of the articles actually went into that and saying, oh, here's something Constantine missed when he wrote the code. You could actually uh, use it like an array um, and then you can save the dot. But that is actually wrong because with that syntax, you cannot pass in a block. With this syntax, you can. And that's what I use for defining get, post, put, delete. That's what I use for defining all the methods, Hamel, Slim, etc. It basically just defines all methods that are also file extensions known to tilt, which is not exactly what Sinatra does. 
but it works. And the same with all these methods, set, enable, disable, configure, help us use, register, etc. And they all do nothing except call the block that you pass to it. So all these methods do the same thing. Um, when you think, for instance, of helpers, so you say helpers do, and then you define a method in there, it's the same as if you wouldn't say that, so you simply define this method on every object out there again. Which is also why I need to define all the methods on every object out there, because I can't be sure what object the helpers actually called on. <laughs> yeah, and then params and sessions just go to the rec object, so they actually work. Uh, which is why query params work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Another nice thing is, so you see, I always highlight this equal sign here. You can just reuse that uh, because you have this uh, multi-assign uh, statements in Ruby, so you can all put all the assignments on one line and have just a single equal sign. Um, another cool thing is they actually don't have the same number. Like they're actually uh, more variables on the left-hand side then there are values assigned to them on the right hand side, which leads to the other variables just becoming nil. Also a very nice trick. Um, for instance, there is this regular expression for passing out the, the, um, the templates, and it just passes it from the file that loads almost Sinatra. Um, so actually, if you would have a complex setup, it wouldn't find the inline template. But again, no one actually does that. And ternary operators, very nice, highly recommended um, for deciding. So it actually only supports inline templates. It does not actually support loading files from view directories. But if you dangle inline templates in someone's face, they think, oh, this is amazing, this is fancy. It even supports that. And they don't go, maybe it only supports that. <laughs> um, again, everything is pretty faked. Uh, everything is the same. Everything is basically a rec builder instance because it comes with a lot. Um, this code has actually been removed in the latest version because that actually became longer. Um, I would have to look up the real code because so one th issue with this is this is a magic value it's hard coded so instead this is this now says date new plus something plus 12 or something and it happens to evaluate to four five six seven due to Ruby internals completely eliminating magic code yeah that's about it it's just this syntax here is like at exit but it's shorter and it's also a keyword, which is always better. Keywords are always better than methods. And as you might notice, it's all about fun. And I have no idea where I am time-wise, but uh, just yell at me if I'm talking too long. From now on, I'll start quoting myself. <laughs> if your app does not run with almost Sinatra, please open a Sinatra issue. Versions are to software what subversion is to Git. Don't include tests. Tests just build the code base. Just commit. The users will complain if you break anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? So we now have this amazing piece of software, almost Sinatra. It's really, really tiny. I recommend just pasting it at the beginning of your code um, so you don't have any dependencies. But the problem is, you have this really, it's really lean code, and uh, no code is better than no code, as we all know. But there is, so you run that on your rec server, and there's a big problem that rec is this giant bloated library, massive dependency, and you want to get rid of it. So I wrote almost rec. Almost rec has a different requirement. So for almost Sinatra, um, the requirement was that all the lines fit on my in my editor window without me having to scroll to the side. Uh, here, the requirement was they don't have to be longer than 120 characters, so I can fit them in a tweet and still add a hashtag, <laughs> which incidentally is also a comment in Ruby, so that works. Um, and it's no more than three lines, so it was three tweets that I sent out took quite a while until people figured out what I'm doing, or maybe they never did. 
but whatever. Uh, so everything works we would expect. Middleware works, it says call, gets status header body, and then you can loop, loop over it and upcase that, and you can just say use that middleware and run the following proc. This example works. Here is the code. Don't know if you can see that. I pull up the object method trick again. Um, the port is hard coded. Not so nice, but it's all the same length. Um, as you can say, as you can see, it actually respects the status code, but it always says OK. So it would be 404 OK. <laughs> and another, another nice touch is so most web handlers will tell you how long a request took. So you can have like built in benchmarking. This does that too. Um, you can see that up here in the logging, but it just makes up the value. <laughs> And, and not only that, it, so it just takes a random value. So random is anywhere between 0 and 1. And then it divides it by 321. So it's also really fast. <laughs> and you only can return a single string in your body. Otherwise, it will not write that out. And use, again, use actually works. Um, and then, because I had some room left after this, which was to my surprise, came to my surprise, it also will open the web browser for you, which is a feature that REC does not have. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we have uh, almost Sinatra, almost REC. What about security? It's actually a big issue is security. And some of you might have seen my talk. Um, at Ancient City Ruby, security is a big issue. So I wrote almost rec protection. And it protects you against a whole range of uh, attacks. Like here, just a few. It protects you against no It actually protects you against the heartbeat attack. Protects you against crime, <laughs> uh, shoulder surfing. <coughs> And, and, and everything you can, you can uh, imagine or can't imagine. And it will actually protect you really, really well against future attacks. So the one thing I noticed you kept laughing a lot, or some of you did, uh, security is not a joke. So this code is not compressed as far as, as much as possible because maintainability, I don't want, like, I don't want to have a security issue creep up and then I have to Google for a blog post explaining to me how my code works. So I rearranged the code a bit, but this is basically the complete implementation. Um, rec protection. Um, and you can actually, it actually has some configuration options. So you can tell it the status code. Like if it, if it thinks it's an attack, you can tell it the status code. By default, it's 4.3. Then uh, you can tell the message, attack prevented, and the content uh, the, the, the attack type. So this is actually already fancier than both right, almost an outright and almost like. Um, and then you get the request in. And then it, it looks at the request and decides, does this look like an attack? Uh, if so, I block it. And if not, I hand it on to the app, which is happening here. And the logic, if, if this is an attack, is the following. So it looks at the schema. Is this an HTTP request? If so, this might actually be an attack, so prevent it. <laughs> is this an HTTPS request? Well, SSL cannot be trusted, as we have established, so prevent <laughs> the attack. Um, or is this an HTTP coffee brewing over HTTP request? You might have seen the RFC for brewing coffee over the HTTP protocol. Um, then the schema is actually coffee. And now it does something really, really smart. Instead of saying attack prevented, it pretends to be a teapot. With the famous 418, I'm a teapot. I had people use this and tell me how amazingly this works, like 9,000 attacks prevented per hour and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Not seen that with other work. Uh, it simply rejects every request. This is security at its best. OK, conclusion. Seriously? 
Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> so, uh, if, uh, if the size of the line is relevant, why did you divide by 321? Or, like, with RAND divided by 321, why not, like, RAND or, like, just one, number one? Oh, because I still had room left. Oh, it was like, actually, you, like, it was yeah, yeah, yeah. more or less than. Yeah, it was exactly 120. That was that was the coding guideline, not less than 120. It was exactly 120, which is also why I edit this, open open the page in the browser. So what's your next uh, project? Uh, hmm. I was considering rewriting Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't know. The thing is, I now have a job that's actually <laughs> <laughs> interferes with my programming. <laughs> um, yeah. So one thing I did, so a, lot, a suggestion that I got a lot after this talk is, hey, why don't you do almost Rails? But first of all, Rails is massive. All those libraries that I rewrote they're basically single purpose, so it's really easy to fake out this one purpose. And also, the other thing is that all the libraries are also libraries where I'm either I wrote the original library that I'm parodying, or I'm on the core team, something like that. Um, so I actually know the tricks, and it's one thing to make fun of my code, but another to make fun of other people's code. Cool. Thanks. And uh, to, to give you some uh, arbitrary context, in uh, 2006, NASA had this mission called SD5, Space Technology 5, where they sent into orbit these three small uh, satellites. They were like big, often like big pies. And they carried all these uh, experimental technologies, including antennas that were quite peculiar indeed. Uh, designing an antenna, as it turns out, it can be hard. And if you look at these antenna, which were in the X-ray spectrum, quite small, they looked somewhat like this thing here, which is kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> Who designed something like that? you might wonder who, who came up with this weird shape and as it turns out nobody designed them they were not designed they were evolved by software so this is uh, something that is uh, quite astounding in some, some way so this is what I would like to talk about I would like to talk about stuff that we can do in code that comes from evolutionary theory, uh, like genetic algorithms and so on. So um, a few of you might know something about this stuff. Uh, disclaimer, I'm not going to go very deep in this. Uh, if you think that feels, I don't know, simplistic or uh, that if you think, okay, this guy is a bit patronizing, he's not going into the details. The real reason is that I really don't know what the heck I'm talking about. This is just uh, actually stuff that I happen to be uh, fascinated by. It's not, I don't qualify as an expert in any of this. It's just that I want to share uh, some, uh, one of my obsessions because I think that it, this is wonderful, a wonderful generator of toys for geeks. It's absolutely fantastic like that so let's start by talking about genetic algorithms which are the more academic let's say topic okay uh, let's uh, I, I will try to give you somewhat of a recipe for genetic algorithms to begin with. Uh, who, who of you has knows about genetic algorithms how many people not many people okay okay so if you know more than I do just shut up <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let the people who know slightly less 
enjoy this. <laughs> um, so I will show you a concrete example of what a genetic algorithm is. This is a program that is actually a program from the 80s, Biomars. Uh, it's a very simple recipe. To begin with, we have genes, these values. It's just a sequence of values that go from minus 10 to 10, nine of them in this case. And these values are uh, fed to an algorithm which generates a shape of them. And there is a property where if you change the values a little, the shape changes a little. Okay, now it's squashing, for example. If I go here, I don't know. Here it seems to be squashed the other direction. Here it seems to be creating more uh, distortion in the image. It creates branches and so on. Okay, So you could generate these numbers randomly and you get a different shape. And this is what Biomorphs do, does. Um, it just generates a sequence of numbers, and then with small variations, it generates a number of shapes. A population. So, this is the first step of the recipe generate a random population. Now, let's assume that I want to rate all of these shapes by some criterion. Let's call it fitness. I will uh, decide here now that to me fitness is the larger shape is fitter okay so I will select the larger shape so this is the second part we apply some kind of selection in this case I'm doing it myself but there is no reason why a computer couldn't do it so for example this one looks a little bit tougher I will select this one okay and then well a few of these are actually quite similar to each other they might be, in some cases, they are the exact, same, not, not the exact same sequence, but the resulting shape is quite similar. I will go on, okay, this one looks good, quite a larger hole, look at this baby. <laughs> and okay, this is another one. So, essentially, I, okay, I can go on and on and on, and I can select larger and larger shapes which one is larger, but some definition of larger like this one. Oh, okay, this one is big. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, okay, you got the idea. So let's, let's recap what this procedure boils down to. This is the recipe. You start with a random population. You calculate fitness. So you select them based on fitness. Then you take the result and you mutate the result randomly. There are small random variations which generate other shapes. So if I select a shape that is large-ish, it might have a few daughter shapes that are a bit smaller, a few daughter shapes that are a bit larger, and I keep selecting the large one. So I, it's like, imagine all these uh, numbers in a big hypercube. I'm tracing a path through the hypercube, right? I'm going from shape to shape to shape. Because if you, if you do the math, which I'm not very good at doing, so I will ask Google, uh, this is uh, 21 possible values uh, by 9, so it's 21 um, to the 9th. Does Google understand that? Yeah, uh, it's a large number. These are, uh, this is the possible number of shapes in this little exercise. It's huge. If I just try to get to the I don't know, the largest possible shape in one shot, I'm probably not going to make it. Uh, but if I trace this path, I will go closer and closer to the larger, to a large shape. This is how natural selection works, right? The difference is that it wasn't nature, it was artificial. So we can make it a little bit more natural by actually having, um, I will show you some Ruby code for change, by actually having an algorithm that applies the fitness function for me. I try to come up with interesting examples. I, I failed, frankly, but I found a silly example instead. So this is what we are left with. We have this piece of code here that where, uh, okay, the target is to come up with three numbers. And when you add the three numbers, which can be in the minus 50 plus 50 range, you got to get 42 as a sum, okay? So 
it's using this Darwinian jam and uh, it's just creating this class which is an organism just like a biomorph and it has genes in this case three genes which can vary from minus 50 to 50 and its fitness is this is actually wrong I believe I think that the fitness is simply yeah the sum of the three numbers taken as an absolute value and the distance of that sum from 42. So the closest to the zero, the fittest. Okay? And then there is the, remember the recipe, we create the population. This is how we create the population. Uh, this is the creature, this is the population size, which is 10 in this example. And then I apply fitness select the ones that are fittest, the fittest, and mutate. This is something that the gen will do for me. And now if I try to run it, I kind of, yeah, I get numbers that in general seem to be 42. And it's a lot of 42s here. 5 minus 33 and minus 14, it makes minus 42. Minus or plus 42 is equal for this fitness function. Uh, uh, sometimes it fails, I have 52 here, 48. What happened was that the initial random population was so far away from my desired result that I, I didn't get there in 20 generation. But if I put 50 generations in here, so I will put this back because I want positive 42. I changed my mind again. <laughs> it is. And I failed again because that's, <laughs> but never mind. Okay, but yeah, now at least, hmm? yeah. At least it's either minus forty-two or plus forty-two with a few very unlucky cases. Okay, so this is a silly example, but this is how you design, you evolve an X-ray band antenna that looks organic, and no person could probably design. No person in her right mind, at least. And um, uh, so you might wonder why you, most of us never heard of these techniques, which are quite popular, actually. They are used in many contexts, not just design by NASA for design antenna, but if you go to Wikipedia, there are a number of practical uses, but not practical enough that you care, most likely, even if it's cool stuff, because they have a number of problems. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at the problems, basically, and again, the problems are pretty much the same problems that come from natural selection. selection. One is uh, it's crazy expensive. I mean, I just, uh, I just showed you how much computation time I took to generate triplets of number that sometimes kind of get close to 42. So yeah, I can have more generations, I will get to 42 every time, but it's probably not worth it for most problems that you might have concretely. Uh, indeed, natural selec uh, selection uses a big computer and uh, a very, very long calculation time, like eons. The second problem is uh, what is sometimes called early convergence, which I can uh, wrap up like this. Um, you get to a solution, this beautiful little antenna, but if your problem, if the context changes a little, a solution that you calculate, you can probably say, okay, it applies to this range. But if you generate a solution like this, as soon as anything changes, the solution might get unfit in a way that is very hard to predict. So essentially, you take your antenna, you apply it to a slightly different context, um, I don't know, lower orbit or whatever, it just fails. This is also something that we see in natural evolution all the time. For example, these guys thought they were cool, and indeed they were doing quite well. And then you have a change of context I don't know, meteorite, nobody knows for sure, but uh, I, I actually have a hunch, I'm totally not a biologist, but I have a hunch that it might not have been this cataclysmic event that we are assuming. Maybe it was just a 
shift in balance in the world and suddenly the little furry creatures take over and they kick their ass. So this might happen to the result of your algorithm as well. And there is another problem with genetic algorithms that is the problem so-called of local optima. Which, uh, again, uh, now uh, I should give an example from natural selection again. Also, um, uh, lately it's, uh, there is this uh, ongoing uh, fashion of putting sharks in presentations. So <laughs> I thought of coming up with first a, li a little bit of music. The difference is that in my presentation, sharks are actually relevant. <laughs> uh, here is a shark. Okay, uh, the, this is how it's built internally. It has uh, a, a brain and not a very great one here, sorry. And uh, here, uh, the vagal nerve going across its spine essentially, then the gills here. And there are branches in the, not vagal, it's uh, the vagus nerve. Uh, branches going to the gills here, okay? And the heart is around here. If you look at another picture of, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find a readable shark picture. Um, this is a general fish, and it's the same, the same pattern. Okay, you have this nerve, gills, the heart, and these nerves are going inside the gills to innervate them. They must open and so on. Okay. Now, what ha uh, this guy and mammals? We have a common ancestor who looked much more like him than myself, frankly. So what happens when you evolve a fish to become a mammal? The shape is going to change. So the heart moves down into the thorax, and uh, we have a neck. They don't. So the brain moves up into the head, and there is this neck in between. So the entire shape is going to be distorted. And indeed, this is how it looks in me and you, so me and you. So this is the vagus nerve, brain, and well, the aorta, which was kind of like in the same place, moved down, so the vagus nerve is still going past the aorta, so it has to go down, and then you have this thing that is called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Recurrent means that it comes back, in medical terms, that goes up to the larynx. And in case you're wondering, the larynx is actually our gills. We, we, we found a good use for them. We mostly, uh, zoo, uh, we, we are using them as vocal cords. They changed over evolutionary time, a few hundreds of millions of years. But this thing can't change because, I mean, evolution cannot jump. If you are born with your laryngeal nerve passing above the aorta, then you are basically screwed. You are, uh, the, the change is so radical that you're probably never going to survive. There is no way that evolution can change something like that by small increments. So you might wonder what happens as your neck grows longer, for example, if you're a mammal with a very, very long neck. Let me show you what happens. Starts here gets down here all the way to the heart, gets all the way back up again. Which is completely silly. It makes absolutely no sense. The only reason for that is that, well, if you take a fish and you evolve it over millions, actually hundreds of millions of years to become a giraffe, you don't get much of a chance to actually go back to the dog. So it's totally a waste of energy to connect the giraffe like that. And this is a problem with genetic algorithms. A fish was OK, but then if you move out from a fish, you cannot skip to a completely different solution. You keep improving that solution, which is not a very good solution anymore. So that's this thing with genetics. Now we get into something that I personally found extremely, find extremely cool. Genetic algorithms are 
good for some particular applications and they make for a nice little toy. But personally, I think that the really interesting part comes when you have a slightly different look at it. Remember the recipe? You start with a random population, you calculate fitness, and then you do this mutation. There are actually two ways to do mutation, basically. Either you mutate the genes randomly or you cross over. That is, you take a few genes from one individual, a few genes from the other, and you mix them. This is what happens to you, for example. One chromosome for each part. And then you repeat. But the, this thing is um, particularly uncool because it requires you to step in and say what the fitness is. I mean, you've got to calculate the fitness, right? But this is not how natural selection works. In nature, there is nobody saying, OK, you are a 12, and this guy is an 11. Let me kill him. Okay? <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Fitness is implicit, it depends on the fact that, well, if you are more fit, whatever that means, you just have higher chances of reproduction. Actually, that's what it means. You are more fit because you have higher chances of reproduction. So this thing with the fitness function is tucked down in a way. We could remove the fitness function and just create a system where, well, a few organisms uh, have a higher chance of reproducing. Okay? And this is sometimes called artificial life. Essentially, you just apply the normal rules of selection. So you need to build a system where these rules can be applied. There is this program that is called the Tierra, for example, that is uh, also for the 80s. It's kind of cool. And it looks like white noise, but actually these things that you're seeing are computer programs. They created an assembler, essentially, and a virtual machine to run this assembler. OK, this is the space of memory where the entire population is running. And that thing there is the ancestor. That is a program in this assembler that is able to replicate itself. It's just like a computer virus, OK? Only it doesn't run anywhere. It, it stays in here, and it replicates. And every time it replicates, there is a chance that its instructions will mutate to some other instruction randomly. Okay? So, of course, most mutations result in a program that doesn't run, cannot replicate anymore. Like, hey, Randy. There. Wow. Look at this. Okay. It's happily replicating. And uh, if I pose this, and I can't even remember how to do this, but I think I can, okay, I picked up one particular little program, I tried to move it here, I don't see the result, but somehow, trust me on that, I can look at its instru assembler instructions. Assembler, like a, it's a byte code, okay? Mm, if I let it run, essentially what I see is that if I look at the size of the creatures, it's kind of going down with time. Can you imagine why? Yeah, uh, because, I mean, if you are smaller, then it takes l fewer CPU cycles for you to reproduce yourself, right? You are shorter. So the operation of copy myself over takes a shorter time, which means that you can reproduce more, which means that there is selective pressure on being shorter. Now, this is cool enough on its own, but the really cool part is that um, if you look at the ancestor, uh, it, it has a, a few no operations. It's not particularly compact. But if you really get trying and you design you learn this little language, and you design a program to be as short as possible, you will find that this thing will beat you. It can almost certainly generate a program that is shorter than your design program for one simple reason. 
some of these programs find the following strategy. Uh, to duplicate myself, I need a routine to duplicate myself. Right? But this language has a call instruction, which jumps somewhere and there are returns at the point of call, like any good assembler. And uh, some of these find out that they can freeload on the call instruction of the next one. They jump into the next organism, they steal their replication routine to replicate themselves. In other words, they are parasites. They, are, they act exactly the same way that the virus acts with you. They use your cell system your um, all the complex organizations into your cells to replicate its stupid RNA that cannot just replicate itself. And this is what they're doing. So they get very small. Until, like all parasites, at some point, they start taking over so much that they start killing their hosts. And then they die. So they are looking for a balance, right? They need the host. So that's pretty damn cool, actually. But, yeah, because, well, uh, to analyze this data, I need to go in with, uh, there are a lot of programs around this to look into the data, understand how it's working. For example, just to understand which kind of genome is more widespread, more successful. No two are exactly alike, right? So it's quite hard to understand, so it's a bit of a mess already. Uh, it's good for uh, research, essentially. I think that I also have a slightly more advanced version that is called Abida, which is essentially the same thing only on a B-dimensional grid. So I can look at the standard ancestor. Here it is. I can actually analyze it. This is a little, uh, a little bit more uh, easy on the eye. On the eye. And, uh, uh, these C operations are probably no operations. I never really looked into it. And if I run it, I can actually follow the flow of the program. This is the routine that copies itself over hmm? until you have another organism. And then it separates. So this is what we start with. But now if I put it on this Petri dish and I, and I run it, they start spreading happily. It's copying it itself over to the neighboring cells, right? I know that you, all the nerd juices in your brain are going crazy at this time. I, I, I think it's so damn cool, this stuff. And um, if I stop it for a moment, and now I look at this organism here, uh, uh, so it's a little bit more complicated than I remembered. Okay, I picked up a random organism and I can run it. And as you can see, it's a bit weird. And actually it's bugged. This one has no chance of actually replicating because mutation made it, well, mutation crippled it. So it's gonna go extinct. But a few of these are actually better than the ancestor. So they will spread out more. And this is the basic idea, okay? Now, one problem with these programs is that, again, it's a bit hard to look at this data and make sense of it. So the one that I really like is this other thing that is called the gene pool. This guy is a bit of an artist and a bit of a programmer. He created these little creatures and uh, they, they kind of swim. They, they don't really swim, they kind of flaunt around. And uh, a few of them will actually, and, oh, uh, sorry, and they have a simple brain, which only has two states. It's, uh, I'm hungry, I want to eat food, and food is this green stuff here. Or I want to mate. I like that specimen there, and they try to swim to it to, to mate. And if they mate, you have crossover and mutation. Uh, but the problem is that they are absolutely, you know, this one wants to mate. You see, this is, it's, let's say, sexual organ. This is a mouse, actually. It wants to eat this stuff. 
Mm, the problem with this is that they don't have a notion of what swimming means. Some of them just sit there. Some of them move randomly, so they end up moving in the opposite direction of where they want to go. These ones die. <laughs> but the ones who happen to be kind of good at swimming, oh, hey, it's statistics. Sometimes they also die, but they have a higher probability of actually mating and having an off uh, and a bearing offspring. And uh, these descendants might be a little bit worse or a little bit better. Over time, the worst gets selected out, the better takes over. So I've been running these on my computer. I, I'm always running these on my computer because I'm a slacker like that. And every now and then I spend like one hour looking at the creatures. And um, recently, I, I think that this run started yesterday night. And I think I have it here. OK, so this is the environment. And well, as you can see, even from a distance, some of these are, uh, they, they seem to be generally similar, which probably means that they, they are probably a species. Okay? They are related somehow. Apparently, one good swimmer kind of emerged and took over. Okay, these ones, for example, are, are really terrible. These ones can't, oh my, let me start this all over again. <laughs> Oh, no, it's still here. These, these are funny. They are a bunch of creatures that don't really move. They're just sitting there. They suck at swimming. I mean, they, they suck at doing anything. They are hungry. You can see their mouths. And they are pointing at some food somewhere around here, like this one probably. But they can't move. And uh, you might wonder why they are all similar and they are overlapped. The first time I saw them, I also... Can you guess why? Okay, this is what happened. Only one of these was born in the beginning, randomly, and they can't move. So other than sitting there and doing nothing, they can just wait to die. But because they have energy and they are not wasting any energy because, you know, they don't swim, they live for quite a long time. And they just sit there living until somebody passes by and says, hey, I like that guy, or they don't really have a gender. I, I like that, and wants to mate with them. So apparently somebody mated with one of these or some other ancestor, and the offspring was a mix between the two parents. So probably they also had kids who were actually swimming away, but these ones couldn't swim away because they looked like the Ancestor couldn't swim, so they stayed here. And now we have a bunch of them. Because they were like, yeah, they had a one night stand with a passing by specimen, which then went away and they stayed here. It's kind of weird. And uh, okay, this is one that actually can kind of swim. It's actually quite a good swimmer. Hmm. I mean, considering that they're just floating around, it's no, not that bad. And if I look here, I can ask for the most prolific one, which is by some measure the most successful one right now. He's hungry, he wants to eat this thing. Okay, it's not exactly elegant, but he managed. And now he's going to reproduce with something. Okay. How, how damn cool is that? <laughs> uh, now I will look for the most voracious. Uh, same, same, same person. Apparently, this is a very successful organism. And if you, if you look at the other ones, well, they are all slightly different. Okay, uh, sorry, I will ask to watch the whole pool. They're all slightly different, but they are all kind of similar to this one, which probably means that they are all quite closely related. And uh, another interesting, okay, this one is, uh, has a little bit of a different color. The way they select their mate is, uh, you can decide on that. So for example, in this case, I decided that they like creatures with a similar color. 
or if you decide that they like, for example, small creatures, then you put selective pressure on being small, because of course, you are small, it means you are beautiful as a mate, everybody wants to mate with you, and you are probably going to bear small children. And finally, this is how the population went. Um, this is interesting. This is food. Okay? It's how food just appears randomly around the place. So it was going up and up. And this is the population. Can you explain this graph? Overpopulation went up. The population spiked and they ate all the food. And there was no food left, so the population died. Indeed. Indeed. Simply, at some point, it's, uh, the population, the population spiked for the reason that they mutated for a while and they were not really going anywhere. Then a race of decent swimmer emerged, which is what we are seeing there. So they could actually swim and go for food. So they spiked because they could also go for mates. So they started making a mating like happy little bunnies, and they started consuming all the food. Up to one point, which looks quite arbitrary, where they consumed too much food, and they had a mass extinction. So most of them died for lack of food. And at that point, not too, too far in the past, food started replenishing because there were not enough of them to consume as much food anymore. And they, uh, again, they are going through a micro extinction. They might actually all die. Or they might not. And the few that are left will be the ancestors of the next few generations. One thing, uh, I, I will close soon. I just wanted to share the, the coolness of it all and sorry for talking for so long. One problem I have with this thing is that it's not open source. I really wanted to play with the code because it's beautifully made. Uh, just to, just for fun, I will start again with a totally random population. Okay. As you can see, most of these don't really, are not really very good at swimming or anything, but it will happen. If I leave it running for a few hours, it will happen. Yeah. Um, I, w I would love, one thing that is true of all these programs about evolution is that apparently nature doesn't like to make things any more complicated than they need to be. So essentially, they only get as complex as their environment needs them to be, which means that simple environment, they get simple. More each environment, they start to surprise you. And because their environment is essentially made up of each other, of other creatures. So uh, the more complex the creatures, the more complex and surprising they tend to become evolutionarily. For example, there is this guy who gave a presentation at Google, uh, which you can find on the internet. And he m did something similar, but he didn't focus on the bodies. Uh, the bodies are very simple geometric shapes. Uh, he focused on the brains as neural networks. And uh, when they evolved, they changed the weights of the nodes in the neural networks. So essentially, they have different behaviors. And uh, they were already surprising. For example, at one point, uh, he made a mistake. Uh, they could eat each other. Mm -hmm. And he made this mistake. This is creepy, actually. Uh, he forgot to put a penalty on the reproduction. So you could have kids and uh, you didn't spend any energy having kids. It was free. Anybody, can, can anybody guess what happened? Basically, they evolved can, a cannibalistic behavior. They said, hey, I have an infinite source of energy. <laughs> they started making like crazy and eating their kids. It's a uh, super creepy. <laughs> now, <laughs> I thought, what happens if you put those brains into these bodies? But uh, that uh, program is open source, but C++. 
and I, for religious reasons, I decided not to touch C++ anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I already did my part with it. And uh, this one is not even open source, so I started uh, writing something similar, unfortunately, in Java. I must apologize for that. I, I had reasons. Um, and so far, I didn't get too far. I just got it for a couple of days, and I managed to uh, the, the problems of this stuff are all in places where you don't expect them, okay? The real problem... Yeah? What's wrong, getting, what's wrong with... <laughs> it's also getting warm if you do it. Oh, oh, sorry. You're right. Um, one, uh, one of the main problems that I had is that the genome is a random sequence of bits. And generating a any shape that makes sense from a random sequence of bits is not as easy as I thought, but above all, making the shape kind of stay similar in the presence of random variations of bits, that wasn't easy either. I took actually a few hours of hit and miss, so now they kind of swim, but, and when they vary, as you can see, they have random variations which are smallish so that natural select uh, I mean the good characters can actually transfer to the offspring okay and uh, they the way they work is they have this um, nervous system there is some some kind of brain in here that uh, in the head that is generating a, a, a sinusoidal wave and uh, the nerves in the body are delaying it. So it's a delay, uh, it's a phase delay system, and that's why they move in this way that looks kind of purposeful. Now I need to add the physics and blah, 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 and uh, then unleash them over the world. But I probably will never get there. I just wanted to tell you about this stuff because I am sure that a few of you will want to play with it. It's just... Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I would have killed when I was 15 years old to have something like this. Okay. Well, okay. That's basically it. <laughs> Any questions? Where can you download that? Sorry, madam. Download. Oh, uh, just. Uh, Google for gene pool. Oh, there is a Mac version and uh, an iPad version of all things. The inter the the port is quite shaky. The interface is not very reliable, and in general, it sucks a little. I couldn't make saving and loading work, uh, which is a, a bummer because I I get weird creatures and they are lost forever. But yeah, that's life. Your I know we had talked uh, at some point about uh, gene pool and how you want to see the generation like a million generations from then, but can't because it has to go through all the intermediary yeah. and it's very expensive in the computer. Yeah. Um, with yours, are you going to do like some sort of like non UI interface that'll just kind of just crunch the numbers to kind of speed things along? Or uh, yeah, I. To, to tell you the truth, if I know myself, I will probably just kind of move on to other toy projects. I mean, I'm not expecting these to. But, and then come back to these a few years from now and say, oh, I will use this uh, other language that I want to use now. But, um, so this is what will happen. What I dream would happen is that, yes, the idea is one of the things that I don't like about this is that there is no way to decouple all the graphics, which are quite resource intensive, from the calculations going on. Uh, so, for example, I cannot run it in a background process at faster speed. There is just no way that I found to do that, which means that it's a bit of a waste. While in yeah, in the Java case, essentially everything happens in memory. And what you see on the screen is just stuck down with a couple of stupid classes. So, yeah, you have views. Mm? Mm -hmm. Those are what you see is a view, but actually the thing is in, in memory. 
one thing uh, we were talking about this with Constantine, for example, a few uh, nights ago. Uh, he was drunk, I wasn't, and um, <laughs> he, uh, uh, one of the ideas is that if you make a lot of this on different machines, and uh, each person and these machines can communicate quite randomly, okay? I mean, can look around and sometimes find another machine on the network, and a few creatures can jump from machine to machine. And uh, I, I give you the opportunity not to tweak the creatures, which you can do here, by the way, you can genetically engineer them, but to change the context, the conditions, okay? Let me turn up the heat, let's see what evolves. Um, this is pretty much what happens uh, with speciation in nature. Speciation, which is the process by which the same genome splits into two genomes that eventually differ enough that they cannot mate anymore, happens usually when there is some kind of separation, usually geographic separation. So they are too far away to mate and eventually they evolve, they diverge. And this means that similar processes might happen. Like you, you might have a predator that is successful and then it kind of invades another machine where you have tamer creatures and it takes over. I don't know, stuff like that. Kind of cool. Mm. 